In today's video, we're going to talk about my top 10 strategies for planning your watercolours. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour, as well as drawing tutorials, even a little bit of mixed media and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing to the channel, it's completely free. And I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube. You can get extra help with colour mixing if you join my Colour Mixing Academy. Click the join button below to find out more. Now, if you frequent any Facebook groups for art or any online chat forums where people talk about painting, particularly painting watercolours, there's an awful lot spoken about planning. The same questions come up again and again. How much drawing do I do? Does the background go in first? Today we're going to talk about my top 10 strategies because the problem with all of these questions is that there's no one answer. So when somebody goes into a Facebook group, for example, and says, do I do the background first on my watercolour? The answer is, it depends. It depends on on the strength of pigments that you're using, it depends on the colours that you're using, it depends on your painting style, it depends on the medium, it depends on a hundred things. So you're saying to yourself at the moment, well that's not very helpful, but I've got some simple questions that you can ask yourself that are going to help you to make those decisions. So although I can't tell you background first or background last, or background as you go through the painting, which is another option of course, I can give you some simple strategies that will help making those decisions much, much simpler. We're going to talk about the 10 best strategies that I have around planning watercolour paintings. So let's start with number one. So the first strategy is choosing the pencil that you use for your underdrawing. And like everything else I'm going to talk about in this video, there isn't one solution that fits every painting. So basically you have some choices. We can discount most of the H grades. Those are very hard pencils, best suited to things like technical drawing. Then we've got things like HB. This is a fairly hard pointed graphite pencil. It's going to make very faint marks, very delicate marks. Well, you might think, what could go wrong with that? I could use that for everything. But the truth is that the downside to an HB pencil or a hard pencil is that it may dent your paper and the paint may sink into the paper. It may also be difficult for you to see it if you've got a painting that's got a lot of colour in because the lines are so faint. If you do choose an HB, and I would suggest that you choose an HB for something like a botanical painting, then just remember not to press hard enough to dent the paper. A hard pencil is also more difficult to erase, so you're going to need to draw very lightly with it so that it comes off easily later on. Then of course you've got the B grades, you've got anything from 2B up to 8 or 9B depending on the brand. All you have to remember with these is that the higher the number, the darker and the softer the pencil. So these dark graphite pencils are going to show up very well. They're going to erase very easily, but the downside to them is they are very smudgy. So if you choose one of these, I suggest that you work fairly cleanly. Draw perhaps a little at a time because there's no saying you have to do all the drawing at the beginning. And use something like a clean rag or a piece of tissue paper to lean your hand on if you're leaning somewhere where you've already done some drawing in order that you don't smudge too much. I would also clean up that pencil as you go through the painting. In other words, as soon as there's an area where the paint is dry and you no longer need that line, take it out. Now, because this is a top 10 video, there are parts of this video where I've actually made much longer videos, much more specific videos. Choosing the right pencil would be one of those. I'll link to any related videos in the description of this one. So if there's any area that you'd like to explore in more depth. So let's go on to strategy number two, and this is composition. Now, this is possibly one of the most important things that you're going to decide on, that you're going to need to plan in order to make a successful painting. Now, as I said, I do have a video about composition mistakes. But at the end of the day, the main thing that actually matters is that you are happy with the composition and that you're happy with the layout before you start painting. And that's the most important thing, particularly with watercolour painting, but with the other mediums as well. Nobody wants to get halfway through a painting and have to move everything, even if it's something that will overpaint like acrylics. It's just a nuisance. It's always much harder to move things around at that stage. So get your composition right, get your composition how you are happy with it, take time over it. Don't be afraid to start again because once you start putting paint on, particularly if you're working in watercolour, you're pretty much past the point of no return. It's too late to decide later on that that tree looks weird, that that person should be further in, that you should have done more flowers. So a question that's very often asked when it comes to planning watercolours is how much drawing do I do before I start painting? And there's a really easy answer to that one. I can give you the answer to that one. The answer is as little as possible. So does that mean you do hardly any drawing? Absolutely not. It means as little as possible for the subject that you are doing. Now that may be a landscape. You may only need something like a horizon line. 
perhaps an indication of where the trees go, and then you can get on with the painting. But say you're doing something much more complicated with lots of buildings, lots of plants, people perhaps, then you're going to need to do a lot more drawing. One thing to consider is that you don't have to, as I said, do all of the drawing at the beginning of the painting. In fact, it's advantageous not to do all the drawing at the beginning of the painting if you've got a very complex subject. I'm thinking of things like botanicals with lots of undergrowth, lots of leaves perhaps, buildings with lots of brick walls, lots of roof tiles, lots of tiny details. If you put all of this in at the start, particularly with natural subjects, we've got lots of plants moving around, you may find that later on you just get in a complete muddle and you start painting something you think well that's that's a leaf and then you realize it's a pink petal and then you're in a lot of trouble so there's nothing to stop you drawing as you go through the painting however you must have a basic outline you must have your basic layout right first of all so you want to get things drawn in broad areas so you might for instance draw the outline of a brick wall or the outline of a roof and then later on you might put the roof tiles in if you need to because you can make that decision later on. If you're not sure if you need to draw every brick, you can wait till you get to the painting part and then decide later if you need to draw. The other advantage to drawing later on, and of course you should always be drawing on dry paint, but the other advantage to drawing later on is that you're trapping the pencil beneath less layers of paint, so it's going to erase much more easily. So the answer to how much you should draw is as little as possible, but as much as the subject needs. And consider leaving fine detail until you're part way through the painting, if you think you're going to get in a muddle with too many pencil lines on your paper. Now the next decision that you may have when it comes to planning your watercolour painting is which colours do I use? And I go back to what I said about pencil drawing and the answer is as few as possible. So I like to work in a limited palette. Now when people talk about a limited palette they can mean several things. They can be talking about a limited set of primary colours, sometimes called a split primary set where you work with a warm and cool of each primary and perhaps a few earth tones. They may be talking about a limited palette that they use for all of their paintings. This is more common with with oil painters actually where a lot more mixing goes on due to the fact that the paints stay wet for longer or it can mean the way that I choose to use it which is just to have a limited palette within each painting so you still have the freedom to own and buy as many watercolor paints as you want but you're not going to chuck them all into one painting because it will end up just looking a bit like a dog's dinner so using a limited palette is a great way of getting a certain mood to your painting a certain atmosphere. Now you can decide what atmosphere that is. I'm actually going to make a video where I'm going to do the same landscape in two different color palettes so you can see this in action and see how powerful this can be. I'm also going to make a video where I go through the stages of choosing the colors for my own paintings. Obviously that's going to take me a while because I need to do some more paintings and film that part of it. But let's quickly have a look at an example of one of my own paintings and the colors that I chose just to give you an idea of the thought processes around it. So I've managed to find a smaller painting. I don't often do small paintings. I just don't enjoy them as much as doing larger paintings. This is quite an old painting, but it's a good example of a limited palette. Now you can see that very roughly down the side here, I've scribbled down the colors that I was using. Now this is really important. It's really important to write your colors down. If you don't stretch your paper and have a border like I've got here, you can note them on a scrap of paper on the back of your picture, something like that. But make sure you keep it with your picture because we all have this intention, don't we, of finishing the painting the next day. But anything can happen actually. You know, your sister has an issue with her car. You have to drive her to work. That means your nephew has to be helped out as well to get his after school classes. Then the dog gets sick and all of this extra stress means you get a cold. And that painting that you're going to go back to next day, suddenly it's three weeks later and you have no recollection of which colours you were using. Even as a professional artist, being able to sort of look and identify colours, I still would have a difficulty with this. So it's always a good idea to write your colours down. And it helps to get that limited palette in your head. So let's look at what I chose here. Now, unusually, I chose cobalt for the sky. I say unusually because here in the UK, warm colours like cobalt and ultramarine are rarely very a uh, good idea for the sky. But you see that I've got Prussian blue here. Now, the Prussian will have been used to cool that sky down. So I likely mixed the cobalt and a little bit of Prussian together. You can see other places I've used the blue as well. This looks like pure cobalt here. And although you can't see a lot of Prussian here, that darkness will have enabled me to mix some very dark greys. Because unusually with this picture, I didn't use a ready-made grey or a brown, which I would sometimes do. I seem to have mixed everything from this selection of primary colours. 
Now gray is a mixture of the three primaries with the emphasis on blue. And to get a dark gray, you're gonna need a strong staining blue, which is why the Prussian will have been important to me. You'll notice the next color here, it's been chopped off a little bit, but I can still read that it says quinacridone rose. And you might look at this and say, well, where's the pink? There's no pink. But actually it's really important when you're working with a limited palette to have a pink. I've done another video all about the usefulness of this color in mixing. I'll link that in the video description. We can see a hint of it here. I've obviously mixed it perhaps with a bit of the blue and I will have used it in the gray to neutralize and cool down those other primary colors. I may even have put a little bit in the sky to warm it slightly. What else have we got? We've got cadmium yellow deep. I've got a plus sign there, but I think I just used cadmium yellow deep plus this other one, which is primrose yellow. Now cadmium yellow deep looks almost orange when applied. And you can see we have a hint of this here. And I don't doubt that I used some of that quinacridone pink to make this rust color appear. I've also used it here and over here. Now I could just have gone to my paint palette and got some bright orange for this little boy that's holding the boat here. But obviously I wanted to stay within that limited palette wherever possible. The last color I've got listed is primrose yellow, which is a SAA color. It's actually a nickel titanate. So nickel titanate is a very pale, very opaque yellow. And I'm rather fond of it for landscapes. If you have, as we have often in the UK, we have rapeseed fields. And so we have these bright yellow fields often in the distance. And to get that sort of color strength, that opacity is really, really nice. You can see I've also used it here in the tree line. I will have mixed both of the yellows in the tree line and both of the blues as well to get some variation in the greens. You can see I've also used some of it here. As I said, it's an opaque color, so you have to be careful where you put it. But you can see here from this combination of two blues, two yellows and a pink, I've managed to get all of these colors. Now there's no right amount of colors for a limited palette and typically a landscape will enable you to use less. The least that I've used would be three primaries and that's likely to be in a sunset. And the most that I've used might be in something like a garden painting where you have lots of different brightly colored flowers and you really need to get out of that limited palette in order to get that expanse of color differences. But for every painting, you should try to use as few colors as possible. And this will give the whole painting a certain look and tie everything together. At this point in the video, as always, can I remind you, please, if you're enjoying this video, could you please click that like button, that thumbs up? It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. If you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. I can help teach more people how to paint and draw and keep making free videos like this one for you here on YouTube. Now, the next planning decision that you may have to make, particularly if you're doing something like a still life object, maybe a floral or a portrait, is do you do the background first? Now, again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Often the answer is yes, so you may need to put the background in first. It may be a background that you need to add in later. That's a little less common, but still a possibility. Well, you may want to put some of the background in first and then work up more background as the painting progresses. Let's talk through some real life examples. So you're looking at part of an old painting of mine, which is a painting of poppies in a field. Now this background is actually a flat wash background. And I made it look as if, you know, I put the background on first. You know, if you were painting in acrylics, you just paint that blue and then paint the red flowers on top. It's not possible with watercolor, particularly not with this color combination. Now you could, for example, paint the green on top of blue because blue is part of green. You wouldn't get this brightness to it. Certainly you could paint these dark green stems on top of the blue, that would be absolutely fine. But if I took the blue behind the red poppies, then it would turn it purple. So here we have an example of a background that could be put in before the main elements, but it also could be put in after the main elements because things are fairly crisp edged. I haven't got to worry too much. Now, if you're talking about things like birds, like animals, then you have an issue because you have these tiny, tiny hairs and feathers at the edge of them, and you can't possibly paint around that. So that means the background has to go in first, but it can't necessarily go behind everything. And I'll explain that in a moment. So this is one type of background here. I have painted a flat wash between these other objects. This could be put in, as I said before, or afterwards. We have to consider that strong colors like reds can run. So it depends how neat you are with your painting, but this sort of background could certainly be put in afterwards. Yes, the blue fades out as it gets to this tree line down here, but it is possible to do that afterwards if you're careful. Again, we're looking at a very, very large painting here. I'm gonna show you the top of it, so I'm gonna slide it down. And I actually put this background in afterwards. So 
this is a still life and all the flowers and everything I was just going to have them on a white background and then I kind of looked at it and I felt like it needed something else so what I did was I just threw some clean water onto the paper without going right up to the edge of these pink flowers which may have run and then I just brought some yellow in from the sides just to give it a little blush of a background color now this board is from a YouTube video I made all about different types of vignette painting. So I'll put a link to that video in the description so you can watch me paint these backgrounds. I never actually finished the pictures. I probably should get around to doing that. But let's have a look at these things. So here we have a background that we've taken right across and behind the subject. Could it easily have been a flat wash? It doesn't need to be a vignette. Now, why is it fine to go behind everything here? That's because the rose itself is pink. So a little bit of pink behind it is going to be fine. We can put that background in first, allow it to dry and paint our pink flower on top. Yes, it would affect the green slightly, but likely not too much because it's fairly pale. This background here, we went around the bird and around the branches. Now the bird itself is quite crisp edged. If the bird itself had softness to the edge of the feathers or it was an animal that had fur and there was soft fur feathering out into the background, then that's a time when I would fade the background as it got towards the animal. You can see that in my videos on fur and on painting feathers. I'll try and leave one or two of those videos in the description of this video so you can see how it's done. Here again is another vignette background that I've done using salt and you can see that I've painted round the starfish. Now the starfish is going to be light yellow and so it's fine for me to put that in first. If the background were a red background though I would consider doing it afterwards because red bleeds very easily and as I painted the yellow up to the edge of the red even if the background was dry that would be likely to bleed. So things you have to consider. What will happen if you take the background color right the way across the thing that you're painting? Unless it's got a similar hue, a similar color, it's going to affect badly the thing that you're painting. This is, of course, the difficulty of working in watercolors. You have to consider the strength of the color in the foreground as opposed to the strength of the color in the background. If you've got a very, very pale background, you can lightly put that in and just paint up to and across it. You have to consider the edge of the objects. Is it hard edge like this, in which case it's quite easy to paint around? Or is it something soft and furry, in which case you might want to fade the background out as you get to the edge there? If this was a furry animal, I tried to take the fur over here, you'd see that line behind it. It wouldn't look very good. As I said, do have a look at my fur and feather painting videos for more information about that. You also need to consider the colors that you're using and to remember that the reds, the purples and the oranges, basically anything with red in, are very likely to bleed as you paint up to the edge of them. All of these things will help to inform your decision about whether or not to paint the background first. Now, what if you don't have a background as such? What if you're doing a landscape? Where on earth do you start? Now, there's a really easy answer to this. 99% of the time, I would start with the sky. Now, the reason for that is that things tend to go on top of the sky. So you may have trees, you may have mountains. The good thing about sky, as compared to foliage and trees and things like that, is there's a relation between the colors. Now, blue is part of green, obviously, which means that if we have a sky and we fade it a bit lighter towards the horizon, which is actually a thing, it's called aerial perspective, things getting bluer and softer in the distance or as they come down to the horizon. What that means is that we're gonna be able to place objects over the top very easily. Stuff like trees with dark branches and green leaves are going to go on top of that sky very easily, particularly if we faded a little bit as we come down to the horizon. There may be times when the sky needs to go around things. I'm thinking of something like a snow-capped mountain because as a watercolorist, you're not going to use white paint. So you would need to stop the blue sky or the cloud shadow as it got to the edge of the mountain. But that's OK because mountains usually have crisp edges. Now, you notice that I said this is a 99% of the time rule. Now, I can't tell you exactly that this is the right strategy for every single painting. I can tell you that almost all of the time it's best to put the sky in first. But could there be situations where you need to put a bit of sky in later on? Certainly there could. One of the things that we spoke about when it comes to backgrounds is the difficulty of the colors like red and purple and orange running quite a lot. This isn't a problem you have with the blues, particularly the lighter blues like the phthalo blues and the cerulean. They tend to stay put fairly well on the paper. So if you're starting a standard looking landscape, haven't got anything strange going on like urban landscapes and strange buildings perhaps. If you're doing a standard landscape and you just don't know where to start, I would always begin with the sky. 
So let's look at some more broad strategies about where to start your painting, because it's one of the most important things in planning, isn't it, is where to actually start putting paint on the paper. So we've talked about the idea of backgrounds. We've talked about landscapes. What about other subjects? Now, when it comes to florals, and this is close up florals or even florals in a garden, I always put the flowers in first. Now, we do have that issue around pinks and purples and reds bleeding. But on balance, I still think it's best to put flowers in first. And why is this? Now, if you're painting from real flowers, there's a good chance that they are going to die or the petals are going to fall on the table, particularly if you're doing something slow like a botanical piece. I once painted some tulips and long after the tulips themselves had you know, completely died and fallen on the table, the vase, the cloth, the, even the leaves and the stems were still perfectly fine. Another problem with flowers, if you're doing a vase of flowers on a table, is the flowers will move. Now, a strategy with this is to photograph them so so even if you're working from life, I would take a photograph of your vase of flowers right at the beginning because what you'll find is that they tend to just turn around and follow the light. They may turn back again the following morning, but it's a good idea to get those bright flower colors in first. Another reason for putting flowers in first, especially with something like garden painting or somewhere where you've got a lot of foliage, is it's far, far too easy just to paint greens over everything and then find you've got very little room left for the flowers. Now, whenever you've got flowers, they are your star ballerinas. They're the main attraction. They're not the chorus. The leaves are the chorus. Now, a leaf, of course, can be a main attraction, but if you're doing flowers, that's really where the focus is. And so you want to make sure that you get plenty of flowers, plenty of clean, bright, clear colors on white paper and get them in first so that you don't end up with very little space to put them in or that you've overpainted white areas. Now, beyond flower subjects, looking at more complex subjects, perhaps urban subjects, a complex still life, something like this, where on earth do you start? Always go back to the basic watercolor rule of light to dark. If you've been painting watercolors for any length of time, or even if you're a complete beginner, you will have noticed that you can't put the light colors on top of the dark. They don't show up and you get another color appear. For instance, if you paint yellow on top of blue, you're gonna end up with green. And so if you are uncertain, always default light to dark and your brain's gonna to wanna to actually skip ahead to some of the easier colors. So I've seen people sort of look at a complex picture and think to themselves, oh, well, I know what that terracotta is. I've got a color that's exactly right for that. I'll put that in first. When really they should be mixing that very difficult sort of pale warm gray path color. So don't let this idea of doing the things that are easiest or the colors that you think you know what to use. Before everything else, if you're uncertain where to start, having already covered backgrounds, skies and flowers, then your next default strategy is light to dark. Now, another question around planning your watercolors is this idea of building up in layers. Beginners often get very confused by this. They've heard that this is something that you need to do. And they'll often come into a Facebook group or an online forum and say, do I have to build up in layers? Should I build up my darks in layers? Or they may even say, I can't get the paint dark enough unless I layer the colors. And some people, even when asking you know, how to make paint darker, will advise other people, you need to just layer the colors. Now, what I will say to you is that if your paint won't go dark enough without many, many layers, then there's two things going on. Either you've got a color which is inherently pale, like a yellow, a raw umber, a cerulean, or you've just got paints that aren't of a good enough quality and don't have a high enough pigment density. Because to get strong dark colors, you shouldn't need to layer. Now, is there ever a time when you do layer your paints? Absolutely. Now, I like to layer when I'm building up texture because layering, they sometimes call a type of layering glazing, which is where you put a transparent color over the top of another color, either to darken it or to change the hue. Layering tends to make things look much more solid. So if you're doing something that's very granular, very textured, maybe some rocks, a pathway, a brick wall, then layering works really, really well to build up that depth of color and all of those different textures to layer those different textures, you can get a really, really complex look. I've got a video that shows you how to do this when splattering with masking fluid. I'll link to that one in the description of this video. But when it comes to strong darks, particularly darks like shadows, putting lots of layers on can just end up with very scruffy edges because it's very hard to paint the exact same area of paint many, many times over. So what happens is you tend to go over the edges and you end up, particularly with things like strong shadows, with these very, very scruffy edges. Now, when I was learning to paint, I learned from a botanical artist and he said to me, something's dark, just put it in dark straight away. Now, I do agree with that. However, that doesn't mean shove your darks in at the beginning of the painting, because that's gonna get you in a lot of trouble. You still need to leave your darks till the end of the painting. But if there's something that's very, very dark, there is no need to layer it. 
I'm assuming if you're painting something very dark, you wouldn't be using a pigment that's inherently pale anyway, because what would be the point? It's not going to work. So you're going to be using those strong staining colors. If you have a strong shadow, a strong dark area like a tree trunk or something dark silhouetted against a skyline, there is absolutely no need to layer. You can go straight in with your dark paints. I have a video all about how to get stronger darks. I'll link that one for you in the video description if this is something you're having a bit of trouble with. Now, another strategy around planning is what to do when you need to choose a technique. So often people will say, what technique do I need for a brick wall, for tree bark, for applying a smooth area of skin tone? What's the best technique for this? And the answer, of course, is there are always many techniques that you could choose from. And your final choice just depends on how you want that area of your painting to look. But my strategy for this, as for my strategy for color mixing, is that you should always try out first on a scrap of paper. So if you have no clue how to paint something, say for instance, you want to do a beach texture, you've no idea at all. Well, the first thing is to watch a few videos. I've got videos on this, other people have videos on this. You'll see a range of possibilities a range of strategies. And then what you want to do is try them out on a scrap of paper. You never want to be putting things on your painting if you don't know what's going to happen. There's far too much reliant on happy accidents. You're much more likely to get an unhappy accident if you don't know what's going to happen when you apply a texture technique or any technique to your paper. So I always have these. These are scraps of paper. These are left from when I stretch my paper. But if you don't stretch your paper, you can just keep a selection of little scraps of paper to practice on. You should always have them next to you when you paint. Most mediums change as they dry. Watercolor dries lighter, acrylics dry darker, gouache can dry darker or lighter depending. So if you've got a color, if you've got a technique, if you've got an idea for how to make something appear on your paper, for goodness sake, try it out first. Do your research, see what the options are. Try it out on a scrap of paper, allow it to dry, place it next to the area. I mean, these are these are quite mobile. You can just paint on this and then let it dry. You can place it next to the area where you're actually going to put the technique and you can see how you like it. Always take the time to go through this planning stage. It will help you to eliminate so many mistakes. So a really big issue, a really big strategy around planning your paintings is, is it actually finished? So we've gone through all of these stages, but is my painting actually finished? Now I made a whole video on this. In other words, ways of avoiding overworking your painting and continuing painting past the point where you should have stopped. I'll link that in the description of this video. But the most important strategy here is just to decide whether you are happy with the painting. And the most important thing to do is to wait. So if you look at your painting and you're like, oh, I'm not sure it's finished or not. I could just, I could just, you know, maybe a little bit more of this. What I would suggest you do is just put it to one side, leave it on a shelf, go away for a couple of hours. When you come back, you'll see it with fresh eyes and you'll immediately be attracted to any areas that you do actually need to put a bit more paint on, any areas that need strengthening. And really at the end of your painting, the only thing you want to be actually doing is increasing tonal contrast. It's past the point where you probably need to put extra details in and looking at tonal contrast, which is very important to making a finished piece of work have a little bit of punch and a little bit of interest to it. Looking at tonal contrast is going to help you to know whether you need to do any more to your painting. But like I said, if you are in the weeds, you know, if you've been looking at it, you know, from four inches away or eight inches away, if you've got better eyesight than me, then that's not the time to decide whether your painting is finished. Have a cup of tea, as we do here in the UK. Go for a walk, come back, look at it with fresh eyes. You can even ask the opinion of someone else. You don't need to be an expert on art. You can get other people's opinions. So my main strategy around this area of your painting is just give it some time and don't make rash decisions. So planning takes a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of experience. One thing that can really help is to work alongside a professional artists. In other words, to go through a course or a tutorial. I have lots of courses available for you. I've even got a free one. I'll link to that one in the video description. You can also, while you're down there, grab some free downloadable PDF guides for no money whatsoever. If you enjoyed this video, I've got lots more here for you on this channel. You can watch another one of my videos right now.